Hello, hello everyone. We'll be starting in a few moments. All right, excited to see everyone joining. everyone. Oh, I see you. Hello. Hi, Anna. Hi. Thanks for joining. Thank so good to see you. Super excited to be here. Well, we're super excited to have you here. And obviously, I love talking to you about all the things. So I'm um, very excited to be tasting some of your wines with you. And it looks like we've got some people still coming in. Um, but we will give them about just another minute for them to enter into the live. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very, very excited. Um, give them one more sec. So it looks like people are still being added in. Oh, I see Sarah. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, let's get started. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura Backrack. I am the portfolio manager. Um, for Naked Wines um, here in the US. And I um, am joining live from New York City. Um, I am very, very happy to introduce um, our guest of honor, Ms. Anna Diogo Draper, um, who is just the most talented winemaker. And we're gonna be tasting some of her amazing wines. And Anna, why don't we say a few words about yourself and where you're joining us from? Sure, so I am in California, all across the country, from, so live from California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Santa Rosa, I'm at home right now. Um, and uh, I've been making wines for Naked Wine since 2012. So right from the beginning, I'm really be celebrating Naked Wine's ninth anniversary. It's really, really exciting. And this being my um, ninth vintage making, making wine for, for the angels, for, for Naked Wines. Um, and these wines we're introducing today are easily my favorite ones to make, to drink. Um, and they were really kind of the, the essence of um, when I started the project of Naked Wines, really this strive to, to make Portuguese or Iberian varietals in, in California. So these were kind of the beginning of it all. So it's really, really exciting. Excellent. Well, we have a handful of folks joining us. Um, I, everyone in the audience, like I do highly suggest and encourage questions. We'll do our best to answer them live or at the end of the uh, or at the end of the live as well. And feel free to pour whatever you're enjoying drinking today. Um, for me and Anna, we're starting off with the Tempranillo, um, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, but before we dive into that wine, Anna, why don't you tell us a little bit about like how you got into the wine industry? Because your story is so unique, um, and why you love making wine so much. <laughs> so I started studying agriculture in Portugal. So I was born and raised there, went to school there um, and knew I wanted to do something related to agriculture, but had no idea what that would be. Um, I knew, like I always say, I wanted to have a job where I could wear jeans and boots to work um, every day and work outside in 
Uh, I just didn't know what that would be. And then in my third year of college, I decided to take a winemaking class. And I just kind of fell in love with it on the spot. I just loved everything, you know, the tasting, the blending, the vineyard part. And I was very lucky. My professor was, um, he was a big winemaker already at the time, still is. Um, and really kind of gave us this very practical, non-academic vision of winemaking and very production driven. And then I worked at the university at the experimental cellar for a while, really liked it, did a couple harvests. I loved it. But being a woman in Portugal was still kind of complicated to be a winemaker. In 2004, I came to California to do an internship and met the two women I really worked very closely with, they were women winemakers and were young and doing all these, um, this amazing work. And first and foremost, I fell in love with California. And then they really showed me that it was possible to, 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 to become a winemaker because that was my ambition. If I was just to do it to start but never be able to climb the ladder, I wasn't interested in that. I knew my ambition it was to to go to the top and, and, and to make wines on my own terms. So um, I, I was here, I returned to Portugal, came back with the intention to be here for a year or two and then met my husband and, and never left. So um, <laughs> long story short, and then in 2012, that's when um, it came up to, to, to make wines for Naked Wines and I, and I started then, yeah. That's amazing. Um, well, um, that's, it's, honestly such an amazing story um do you want to tell angels about um your, your experience like lessons you've learned along along the way and like what truly inspires you to make the wines you make for us the, the big inspiration i think 99 of wine will tell you starts in the vineyard so these vineyards you see that's what i take a lot of inspiration um there's two places one is the vineyard you will just when i'm walking the vineyard always these crazy ideas come like tasting grapes, seeing each vintage, there's a different flavor profile that you can anticipate the wines will have. And that will kind of drive a lot of the winemaker deci wine making decisions for the year. But then also the blending table. And that's kind of how these three wines were to be born. Because it, out of the trio, the first wine th that we knew we wanted to make was the blend. And then within two years of making the red blend and tasting the two components, this idea kind of came you know, as to why weren't we making, can we also bottle these varietals separately and give the angels the option to, or the, that, that ability to see what the, the blend is, but then what each component tastes like and really, you know, kind of in a way be what we make, you know, what, what, we, what we see, what we taste um, when, we, um, when we're on the blending table. Um, so those are really, really two big inspirations, but I'd say the vineyards and then just California in itself, there's such a great, ground to 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 discover and there's so many different avas and so many different terroirs to to work with and particularly dibian varietals but also with cabernets i make three different cabernets from Snow, throughout Sonoma county it's really fascinating to find vineyards i just found this little tempranillo vineyard in the heart of Sonoma valley that we're going to be bottling next year for the first time a very small bottling so kind of those discoveries is what keeps me going and really you know motivated and interested and never kind of that kind of don't stop never stop go 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 <laughs> I think it's just incredible that you find such a seamless way to connect your two homes and yeah. really make them authentic to yourself as well um, it's really inspirational well um let's I guess we should dive in um to the first wine of the trio um which is the Tempranillo um and that's gonna be this beautiful label um, before we dive into like the wine itself, do you want to tell angels what inspires, um, your obviously stunning packaging, um, <laughs> capsule to label? <laughs> so, um, all three, this is absolutely a trio and it was kind of blended or was made in this way because as you could tell the colors kind of, you know, you have the, the orange and the blue, and then on the Tariga, you have the blue and then the orange and kind of, I really wanted to tie in all three. But the inspiration are what we in Portugal called azulejos, which are, are Portuguese tiles. Um, and visually they're so striking um, and there's so much variety. I feel like we could do a thousand wines 
and never repeat <laughs> the same tile because they're, they're just they're just all throughout Lisbon. So in, in old buildings, if you, if you ever have the chance to go to Lisbon or Porto throughout Portugal, they actually cover the outside of buildings. It was a way to keep, you know, keep the, the, the buildings intact, keep them beautiful, keep them clean. Portuguese are very tidy in, 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 in a, a messy way. Uh, <laughs> and it's just absolutely gorgeous to walk throughout Lisbon and see them. So that was really the inspiration when these wines came, came to, to be born. And then each one of my labels has a different, um, there's a connection to them, but there's a different um, inspiration in those different, in those different tiles and the color and the color scheme. Um, and you, that was the goal to have something that striking, you know, is really visually striking that kind of made a, made a mark. That's so beautiful. Um, well, let's dive in. Um, I already have my glass poured as well. Um, and I think what angels would really love to know is, um, you know, your winemaking process when creating Portuguese inspired wines in California. So the, 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 this vineyard was a vineyard I found through a Portuguese friend <laughs> who sells barrels and in logical supplies and makes a barrel of wine from this vineyard every year. And I tasted his wine before. I absolutely loved it. And uh, my friend Hui and he put me in touch with Stuart, the owner of the vineyard, St. Amont Vineyard. And the conversation kind of started there. I, um, and then visiting the vineyard, it just really, really resonated. It's, it's this beautiful valley in, in, in Jackson. So right on, on, on the heart, in the heart of Amador County. Um, there's a lot of ample water naturally. So the vineyard, it's not 100% dry farm, but almost because they have so much nat nat uh, natural moisture in the soil. Um, and it's all farmed with Portuguese grapes. It's absolutely incredible. It's like this dream come true, this little paradise valley. Um, and and, and the, the sandy loam soils are really perfect for these grapes to thrive. Um, Stuart's dad planted the vineyard, and so he worked with authentic Portuguese clones. Um, particularly the Tempranillo, it's really, really impressive because Tempranillo clusters can be absolutely ginormous. I've seen, you know, Tempranillo clusters as big as my head, and I have a big one. <laughs> um, and these are beautiful, small clusters, great concentration of flavors. Um, and that's really what I look for. And if angels have tried the, for instance, the Paso Robles Tempranillo, it's a very different fruit profile from this one. The, in Paso, close to the ocean, there's a lot of red fruit, really bright acidity. This one is the opposite, very dark fruit, um, kind of black cherry, cassis, a lot of mocha, um, really, really dark fruit. And the, during fermentation, those are the notes I, I try to strive. So um, we cold soak for about two to three days, start fermentation. Um, we can last on an average from 25 to 30 days. Um, and then we barrel down straight from, from um, post-fermentation, post-primary, goes through malolactic fermentation in, in oak, gets racked only twice, and it spends about... 18 months in oak, um, about 25% new oak, um, and we use all um, French oak on all these on all these three on all these three wines, um, and that is really the goal is is to um, I like to say not to over extract but enhance that that beautiful natural concentration that Tempranillo has in Amador, and you know it's got warm warm days, cooler nights, really nice bright acidity. Usually these grapes are farmed are farmed are harvested. Um, towards the end of September. Um, and the, the Tariga can be picked sometimes a month later. So in the same, um, in the same exact uh, vineyard. So a few, a few blocks apart. Um, yeah, and it's just, I love the, the beautiful dark fruit. 19 was a great, really good year. It was a slightly cooler vintage. We had a few heat spikes, but towards more towards the, the end of the, at the end of the season. And we were, we were able to bypass completely, completely that. And, I just, I love the elegance of 19. I think the 18s were a little more exuberant. There's kind of a restraint in the 19s that, um, and a softness too in the mid palate on all these three wines. They're very lush and they're still very, very young. I mean, these wines have been in bottle for about four to five months. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for them to, to, to age. Um, all three of them, they have super bright acidity. That's one of the things I think I love to combine this kind of old world, new world uh, approach to things, but acid is totally old world. I love 
reds with bright natural acidity, um, and that's what gives also red wine great ageability in, in, in bottle. And how do you eat them for? Like all three of them? Friends are logging in. Thank you. Obrigada. Even friends from Portugal are here. <laughs> um, Anna, how, like, what would you suggest? Like, how long could these lay down for, say, if angels like to, you know, have a big collection of wine and are really interesting in aging them? But how many years would you say? I think you can easily age these wines for five to 10 years. The Turiga probably even more. Um, there's, um, there's such a structure, the tannin, um, the matrix of, of, of Turiga is just, um, just absolutely enticing. It's a, it's a wine I always say you can chew almost. So I'd say that Turigu probably can age it easily for a good 10 to 15 years. But I'd say 8 to 10 years, I think it's a good, it's a good guideline. And I, I'd say these wines always, these are the wines that I make that sell out the fastest. Sometimes in a month or two, these wines are sold out. It's a limited production. So I always, I always have angels messaging me, you know, upset they're sold out. So I always say if you want to grab a few bottles to hold on to, it's best to make that, you know, to purchase them at first and hold on to them for two, three, five years. And it's fun to open them and see how they change also um, over the years. I think they're fun for a party to open all three side by side. Maybe not for a wine at home, you know, a night at home to open three bottles might not be the best thing to do. But if you have friends over, family over for a party, I think it would be a really fun thing to taste all these three wines uh, side by side. Oh, I agree. I mean, it first of all, it's like you're bringing a present just physically because of how gorgeous the packaging is. But then once you open up the bottle, I think a lot of people are really impressed. And there's an educational factor too, because these might be varietals that your average, uh, you know, wine drinker might not know about. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, they aren't the classic wheelhouse of, you know, Bordeaux varietals or Burgundian varietals, and there's something unique in their own, um, which is really, which really sets you apart from the other winemakers within our portfolio. Yeah, and then adding, this is the new surprise, actually white adding wines from Portugal next year. So it's even more <laughs> exciting. Um, I had a haha -ha moment a few years ago and really pushed on my train ride, on my train ride, on my plane ride back. <laughs> had this epiphany that I really wanted to go back to my roots and, and produce wines in Portugal again. Um, and I'm, I'm really, really excited. And um, just the quality of the wines that from these last couple of vintages, the rosé was the first one and now we'll have a couple of reds to go with it. And I'm, I'm really excited about that too. We're, we are so excited. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to, you know, you made a really good point. Yes, these wines sell out pretty quickly. Yes, they are sourced from a single vineyard, so that's why the production is more limited than some of our other wines. But I did want to let people know that um, you are able to reserve 6 to 15 bottles per vintage of all three of these wines. Um, and that's available right on our website. Um, we call it Never Miss Out. You guarantee for dibs of, you know, the next vintage coming down the pipeline. So just keep that in mind, folks. It's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely, because I know I've missed the boat a couple times and... I've learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. Well, would you say that this, like, how do, would you distinguish Tempranillo from Toriga? How are they different? Uh, the fruit profile, I think, is very different. The structure of the wine, I mean, you know, Tempranillo is, as it is, a big, a big wine on its own. And then Toriga as just the structure, but the, the thing for me, Toriga, as, as, that is very unique is its aromatic profile. There's this violet, dry, like crushed violet tone to it that just kind of this very floral notes that really, um, when, you, when, you, when, you sniff a, when you sniff it, that really kind of comes through. Um, and I think that, but the most interesting thing to me is when you, it's called the synergy of blending and you just can't explain it. And when you blend them together, something magical, this alchemy happens and the wines just, they kind of soften each other in a way. It's almost like Tempranillo and Graciano, which is a blend you see a lot in, 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 in Rioja. And Graciano on its own is kind of this ugh, like tough varietal, um, although I think Torriga is not. Uh, but once you <laughs> with Tempranillo, it really goes. And that same thing happens with Torriga because it's, it's, it's a very unique varietal on its own and I could see 
as, as like Tempranillo is such a, a, a loved um, varietal, I think for, for, for angels particularly, but then Toriga is, is, is a harder varietal because it's got all these nuances with floral, fruit, the texture, it's a big wine. But when you combine them together, it really is this, this, this magic alchemy. And every year, when I sit in the blending table, I go back and forth playing with percentages. <laughs> and every year, no fail, I go to the 50-50. That's the one. I still play with it every year, try to in the blending table if there's different proportions. But um, I think we've been making this wine since 2014. Since that time, it has always been 50-50. <laughs> we have never done a different, a different proportion than, than the 50-50. Yeah, I mean, I I'm I look forward to you know your release every year, but I feel like, you know, since I've known you over the past six years, you know, you say fifty fifty, it always takes the cake, because, <laughs> <laughs> and and it works. It does an incredible job. Um, well, speaking of Tariga, should we pour that next? Yes, I just I I I just did. There's um I love to call it it. It's such it's such a it's such a lingo like a winemaker lingo. There's a funkiness to the Toriga. Well, the the, the Tempranillo has a very um, I think clear fruit notes, a very clear fruit profile. There's all these secondary aromas that happen in the Toriga. This kind of leather um, note to it. There's tobacco, white pepper, and the floral. There's just this like there's so much going on um, in, in there. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I think it's very unique. Um, it's Tariq is very hard to find in California. It's not a, a common varietal at all. It's the most planted, one of the most planted varietals in, in, in Portugal, along with Tempranillo, though we don't call it Tempranillo there. We call it um, Aragonese in the, in the south and uh, Tinta Juriz up, up, up north. Um, and this blend is obviously a classic Portuguese blend, but to find Toriga in, in, in California, um, it wasn't easy, it was a hard task. I knew I wanted definitely to find, um, to find some, some Toriga. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to work. This, this, this vineyard is beautiful. Like I said, it, it sometimes matures about a week, a week, a month behind um, the Tempranillo. The canopy is huge. I mean, the, the Tempranillo, we're always working to make sure, you know, the food's protected, there's no sunburn. And on the Tariq is the opposite. We're trying to open that canopy, kind of, you know, where's the cluster? Trying to find some, some, some light in there um, and, and, and search for that um, perfect ripeness. Um, and the clusters, um, they tend to be more elongated and the berries are small, small, small. There's just this incredible concentration of, of, of flavor in, that comes out of this, of this vineyard and this block. They have more than a block, but the block we get, I think there's, a, there's just an incredible uh, concentration of flavors. It's, yeah, absolutely delicious. What would you suggest pairing with the Tariga? And also, I, I guess for all three wines, is there a specific go-to food pairing you have? For each of these wines, yeah, um, the 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 Tempranillo, I love like a kind of a Sunday dinner roast chicken or like a I love like um, roasted duck is a big thing in Portugal too. I like a, um, rice <laughs> with rice. It's this very and chorizo, and I absolutely loved it with it. I think that smokiness of the chorizo and the duck goes really well with it. Um, the Toriga, I love like a mushroom risotto because I think that earthiness of the, the mushrooms does really well with, uh, with the, with the Toriga. Maybe some lamb, um, like some, um, a lamb chank or even like, um, how do you call those, those little um, ribs, like lamb ribs? No, that's not the name. Uh, barbecued, I love that too. Um, and then for the blend, I think the blend goes with everything it's just such a versatile wine I, I don't think you can go wrong i actually think it's the perfect wine just to sip on its own um i love it with tomato based dishes uh, like i think with pizza it's perfect i like to call it gourmet pizza uh, but <laughs> pepperoni will do too um even a steak i think can go well with any of these three wines they're, they're, they, I think they have a really good dichotomy of softness and earthiness with structure. So I think it makes them such so... Lamb chop, thank you. <laughs> Someone just wrote. 
Um, I think they're so versatile, um, and you could really pair them with with a lot of different a lot of different things, uh, either lighter dishes or I think they also have the 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 like I said the structure to hold on to like a nice New York cut, like it's my favorite steak or something like that. Um, I, I think that all three of them would 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 do very well with it too. Everything sounds delicious, and now I'm now I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, well. Um, one last question before we move on to our blend. Um, because Pariga is more of an unheard varietal, um, for those that are more familiar with like traditional, more commercial varietals, like what what kind of fans are gonna like Toriga? People that like Merlot perhaps or a little more structure. I think if you like heftier wines like a petite Syrah, uh, it, it's not as um I think it's not as Tsitsurai or Zinfandel can be sometimes a fruit bomb. You know, they can be just this explosion of fruit. And Tariga is much more concentrated. So I would call it a more restrained Zinfandel or a more restrained Petit Syrah, I think would be a good, a good analogy for the Tariga. Um, because it's got, you know, it's got that structure, that fruit, but a little pulled back, a little restrained, not as effusive as as a petite Syrah, as a petite Syrah would 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 be. I'd, I'd say that that would be a good a good analogy. Nice. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, let's move on to the you know the blend that started it all, <laughs> the Tariga Tempranillo. This is by far the my favorite blend of all of the blend, the label, <laughs> all the labels that that I have. I just I love this label. It's just absolutely striking. I agree. And I think, you know, I think our customers agree. I know our staff is very, very into your labels and packaging. Um, and just change the corks. I know. I saw. They're stunning. It's very cool. I'm like super, super geeked out on these corks. Mm -hmm. um, and then the label, I just love it. It's really this kind of this like ah, moment <laughs> synergy between the two varietals really um um you know really kind of blending together just the blend is just the perfect combination of of, of the two of them um and it just shows such great balance such um elegance um it's elegance but elegant but very concentrated at the same time um and i'm i, I just uh, uh, every vintage I say it's my favorite and I keep saying that over and over and over and over and over but I'm really happy with these 19s um, again I think it was a great vintage um, it was very mild so we really got nice acid nice nice ripeness um, or nice ripeness while maintaining a, a good acidity um, but at the same time there's just this structure this this kind of exuberance um, that I really really like about this blend amazing ah uh Sorry to go back to food, but just thinking about different cheeses, um, you know, I feel like now that the world is reopening, at least, you know, California and New York are reopened as of today. I'm yes. sure there's going to be a lot of happy, like, happy hours in our future and people making, you know, having like barbecues, a lot of charcuterie and cheese plates. Is there any specific cheese pairing that you would pair with these wines? Yes. With a blend, I am in love with this cheese called Point Loma. It's a local California cheese. I think it's from Mendocino County. And it's this mild cow cheese, but it's, it's super versatile. Um, I absolutely love it. I found finally, Portuguese are crazy about charcuterie. Chorizo, salpicão, you name it. And I found, I can't find Portuguese, but I found a, a, a Spanish one from Black Pig, which is the ones we love, that I think would be perfect with any of these three wines. Um, and it's just like thinly sliced. It's a sort of a, sort of a chorizo for better explanation. I'm not sure how to say it in English. Um, and it will go perfectly well. The Tempranillo, I definitely go um, for like a nice cheddar, like a really sharp cheddar, I think would be really good. And the Tariq, I'd go for a good blue cheese. Like, I think blue cheese um, just would really, like, that sharpness of the blue cheese would go really nice uh, with that kind of, all these myriad of flavors and aromas that, that there's so much going on there that I think that sharpness of the blue cheese would really cut through that really nicely. I love cheese. I love cheese, too. I could <laughs> probably talk an extra half an hour about <laughs> all 
totally. Earrings. Um, you know, food. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're starting to, uh, you know, approach the end of our time together. I, I did want to um, address a few questions from the audience. Well, more of a comment. <laughs> um, one of our one of our angels saying, "I really need you to do a white." Do you want to talk about any white lines that you're making in the future? Want to plug any potential future projects? Of course. So we will be making a white wine out of Portugal um, in 2021. So this upcoming harvest, I'm actually flying in next week to work on all these different projects and prepare harvest there. Um, and it's going to be a variety. It's going to be from the Tejo region, so very close to Lisbon. Uh, and it's going to be a varietal, an aromatic white of a varietal called Fernão Pires, um, which is a very aromatic white. I'm, I mean, you could compare it maybe an Albarino, not as sharp as an Albarino, but very aromatic, really crisp. Um, and it's a cooler region, so really bright acidity. Uh, and I'm really, really excited. I still haven't seen the vineyard that will be working. There's two potential vineyards um, that will be uh, scouting and deciding where to source the fruit from. But um, yeah, my wines are all, I, the only one I make is a rosé. So I make a rosé from Portugal, which should be released um, sometime this summer. Um, and then to add, the, to add this white is really, 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 really exciting. I love making reds, but I, I've, I've been, I did the Verdeo for a while and then that, that, that project stopped, but I'm really eager to go back to, to, to making wines for you, uh, whites for you guys. I think everyone's super, super excited. Um, and just for all your projects, um, when you go to Portugal, like, you know, I highly suggest everyone in the audience, please follow Anna at Anna Diego Draper Wines. Um, I'm sure that she'll be posting a few snaps um, and shots of your, your adventure out there and, you know, hunting down the best, the best wines thanks to our angel funding. For sure. Absolutely. I'll make sure to take lots of photos and videos and um, really kind of show you what we'll be doing and working on, on all these vineyard sourcings. It's, it's where we will be right now. It's sourcing all these, all these different vineyards. Oh, someone just tried the blue. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. So for sure, please make sure to follow me uh, on Instagram and yeah, I'll be posting um, all these, all these things on my, my Portuguese adventure. And I can't wait. It's been too long being away from home and my family and my friends. And I, I'm so, so excited to go back. Well, I think everyone wishes you the safest travels. And I'm so happy that, you know, we got to taste through the iconic trio together. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I hope you have great, a great travels and we'll see you soon. For everything, Laura. Thank you guys for joining right. us. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye.